I'm going to talk about a topic that's not well understood. Doesn't matter. Everyone has an opinion on it. If you ask people what is their opinion, they will give you an opinion about it. And I'm going to try to, in a sense, sort out what this is all about, what the various dimensions might be. Now, are you, is the translation coming through well? Because I don't want to speak too rapidly, you know, and <laughs> especially since I'm saying I w we're going to look for understanding of this topic, and understanding doesn't necessarily come de prisa. You have to go slowly. So, th this is what I'm going to ask this question Does privatization improve education? And we'll see what your answers are. In fact, you're going to have an opportunity to give your answers. Why is this topic important? It's important because it's an increasing focus of educational policy. Countries that sponsored schools only through their governments, public authorities, now are either looking at it or making some changes. In fact, at the end, I'm going to tell you what happened in Sweden in terms of this phenomenon. This is also a phenomenon that is promoted by the World Bank. And why? Well, if you take the simple arguments, the advocates say it creates a more effective school system because now you have competition for students. Number one. And number two, you can match students more closely to the strengths of a school through a choice system like this. The um, argument is not only that it's more effective, but also that there's greater equity. Why? Because many families, if not most families, have choices of schools only in their neighborhood. That's not even a choice. That's the school that they are assigned to. And by having this kind of system, you can create choices of schools outside of the neighborhood. Now. The opponents argue that there are consequences that go well beyond these claims and that the claims themselves are not well supported by the evidence. And fortunately, we do have some evidence on these issues, not from one country, but truly from around the world. I should point out that educational privatization can mean many things. It can mean private funding, ownership, and operation of schools as we have in the U.S. In the U.S., 10% of our students are in schools that do not receive any help from the government. They're completely private in their funding and operation. It can mean the private operation of government schools. In the U.S., a public school can contract with a private enterprise to run a school. And so the funding goes to a private enterprise. That's a different form. And then it can be used in other cases for government funding for private schools. That is where the power is given to the parent or the funds are given directly through subventions to private schools to educate children. Now, there's a fundamental tension whenever we talk about the subject. And the tension arises from the fact that schools have both public and private purposes. The public purpose is that schools have historically been charged with promoting civic participation, a historical and cultural heritage, a common set of economic and political values, and a common language. And I will acknowledge some exceptions. Certainly in the history of Spain in the last century, the question of what was a common language was not decided democratically. Okay, But there are also private goals of education. Families generally have the right to determine the individual development of their children. And what happens to their child educationally contributes to the adult well-being of that child. That is, these are private benefits, private gains that a child receives from education. So both society, 
or we could say the public and private uh, interests have concerns about education. And the third point here is important. These are not completely compatible. And you have to acknowledge that from the beginning. Those who simply say, yes, they're all completely compatible are distorting the picture or they're, they're not telling the truth. Okay. Now, in a sense, the most interesting form of this debate was proposed by Milton Friedman. I think most of you know he was a libertarian uh, economist in the US. He died at the age of 94, about six years ago. And in his book on capitalism and freedom, he has two basic questions, very fundamental questions about education. The first question, who should pay for education? Should we as families? Should the state, the government pay? And his answer is quite interesting. He acknowledges the social or public benefits of education and creating common values necessary for democracy. And he says, therefore, the government should fund the basic levels of education because it's absolutely necessary for a democratic state. Now, he acknowledges that an education educated society also raises everyone's productivity through what economists call externalities, the, the effects of higher levels of knowledge and technology and so on, not just on the person who's been benefited from additional education, but from so the society as an entirety. But then he asks a sep sec separate question, which is quite different. Normally, people say, well, if the government pays for education, the government should operate the schools. And Friedman said, wait. To answer that question, we have to ask, who can do a better job in serving society and individuals? And because he's a libertarian, and because capitalism and freedom is the name of his best known book, he answers, because of the superior efficiency of the market in producing goods and services, and he would add, and the freedom of people to choose, the operation of schools should be done through market competition rather than government. And he would say, rather than a state monopoly. There's some issues of what that means exactly, but for libertarians, the state is always a monopoly. And so he proposed to do this in a very clever way. He said, so how do we get the government to fund schools but give people choices and have a market of competitors, educational competitors for students? And his answer was that we give the parent the power of a voucher, of a certificate which entitles the parent for tuition at any approved school that the parent chooses. And schools can meet the requirements for approval by obtaining vouchers and by attracting students. And the requirements for approval are those concerns about teaching the values of democracy. So a school that is teaching the values of democracy will be eligible to compete for students. And then these vouchers can be redeemed by schools by giving them to the state to obtain the funds. Now, I should add that there's no voucher system in the world today that actually gives out these certificates. Instead, the schools apply, they give evidence, accountability of the numbers of students whom they have, and they're meeting the requirements, and they get paid directly by the state. So the voucher is kind of a symbol of the system, a symbol of the power of a parent to decide which school his or her child should go to. And this market would operate by competing for students and their vouchers, trying to provide the attractive programs that, that would get their students. And so market competition is used to create and ensure good schools. Schools that cannot attract sufficient numbers of students simply aren't going to survive. So bad schools will disappear. They will evaporate. Huh? Now, where have educational vouchers been used? Well, Chile is 
the classic example, Chile under Pinochet was very influenced by uh, Milton Friedman. He, in fact, his students in the University of Chicago were called the Chicago Boys. Uh, I should, I should, uh, I, I could add some things to that, but will not because we don't have time. Um, and they've had this national system of vouchers now for 33 years. So we have a lot of evidence on what happens when you convert from a state system of public schools to a market system where public schools can still operate. And in Chile, the only schools in the rural areas are public because there, is, there aren't the concentrations of populations for competition. Um, but also private schools, including schools that are for profit, can enter and the market and compete. Sweden is very interesting, and I'm going to say, give, say some very interesting things about it that uh, are now being debated in Sweden uh, towards the end. But Sweden has had educational vouchers since 1992, very recently in comparison, let's say, with Chile at least. And compared to the Netherlands, Netherlands has had a voucher type of system since 1917, where any of us could start schools and compete for students as long as we met the requirements of what a school is supposed to be in terms of uh, personnel and in terms of regulations, accountability, in terms of uh, uh, national testing and curriculum. Now, just to mention this, in the States, we've been experimenting with uh, vouchers in local areas. Milwaukee has had a voucher plan since 1990 with more than 20,000 students participating. Cleveland since 1995. And then there have been experiments. These are true experiments. I'm not using the word experiment in a loose way. These are true experiments where students are randomly assigned to a voucher or are not assigned to a voucher. And then we study what actually happens to them educationally. There are problems in evaluating these kinds of systems. And, and here we can generalize to all systems, but particularly systems that have a major component of privatization. The first thing is, as you know, this is a highly ideological and emotional issue. People without any details on the system, if they will respond to the language very quickly in terms of whether they, they favor it or whether they oppose it. Second, public opinion is uninformed. There's little understanding or useful information even in countries and cities that have educational vouchers. There have been public opinion polls to ask what their, what their views are and do they, do they support it or oppose it. And then they're asked, kind of a truco, they're asked to define what it is. And they can't define what it is, they don't know but it's the language that they're responding to. In the case of voucher plans, there is no single plan, but many. And one of the things that is not well understood is that when we evaluate education, it's not just evaluating the PISA scores or the scores in, of international comparison. Schools are expected to do much, much more than this. And if we were to talk of test scores, we would not even begin to address the democratic requirements and components and functioning that we expect of schools in our, our kinds of societies. So I'm going to use the voucher plan as an example, but the same issues arise in any kind of educational system. The first thing is that privatization systems generally and vouchers can differ profoundly in design and consequences. And there are just three dimensions to worry about. By the way, I can't remember more than three of anything. So I have five children and they have to wear the name plates so that I can call them by their names, okay? But these three components are finance, regulations and support services. And if you analyze these three components, you can tell an awful lot about any educational system, including one that's a government system that where there is no privatization. In terms of finance, we're concerned with the size of the voucher. Is it low or is it high? If it's low, 
not many schools will compete for these students. Um, if it's high, you will get a lot more competition. A lot, it will be a much more interesting market from the point of view of uh, schools competing for students. Secondly, will additional parental fees be allowed? That is, can schools say, well, we are a more expensive school, so we will take the voucher and add to that voucher another thousand euros an academic year. Uh, the Friedman plan would allow that. Friedman would allow families to spend as much as they want in addition to the voucher. That's going to have consequences because this means that the schools are likely to be stratified or segregated by income, family income. Uh, but you could have the opposite system. You could have a system where there are so-called compensatory vouchers, that is larger vouchers for students from poor uh, or immigrant backgrounds, uh, or you could designate what, what those are, uh, students with disabilities, or you could even have both. In Chile, they have just started a system where they are adding 50% more to the voucher for children from low-income backgrounds, but families can also add to the voucher if they have the income and they so desire to do that. In addition to finance, there are regulations, and privatization systems will differ according to regulations. First, must a school accept any student who applies, or in the case where too many students apply, accept through a lottery? Um, it depends on which system you're talking about. Some of them, the school has the right to accept students and to reject others. And that has some implications, again, for students from poverty backgrounds, from minority backgrounds, ethnically different backgrounds, and so on. Uh, because schools typically like to accept students who are going to, they're sure will be successful and will not require additional attention or resources to make that happen. Curriculum, are there common requirements? And how serious are the common requirements? In Holland, for example, the, most of the curriculum at the, the basic levels is set out by the state and schools must use that curriculum. Uh, testing, uh, at the end of the year, are the schools required to use a standardized test to see how much progress the students have made? Uh, personnel credentials, must teachers be qualified, what are the qualifications, and so on. And then one that can be quite uh, contentious, school sponsorship. Uh, can a school be religious? Now in Holland, that, that system that started in 1917 was started because of the s struggles between the Protestants and the Catholics. That is, this is what was called a pillarized society where all institutions were separate and they would then fight over a common school. And so they then said, well, let's just give freedom of choice to solve that problem. Now, today, by the way, the Dutch society is highly secularized and those issues are not big issues in Holland. But consider some of the religious issues that are occurring with some of the immigration coming to Europe and the US and what that implies in terms of what schools will look like. Support services. Well, let me just say very quickly that choice doesn't work well if you don't have access. And in many areas, you have to provide transportation in order for there to be choice. Good decisions in a market environment are informed decisions. And again, where does that information, accurate information, come from? Of course, schools will provide their own propaganda, but that we're not talking about that kind of information. We're trying to talk about something more objective. Um, and then there are issues of adjudication if there are disputes. Now you could say, well, how can we evaluate this system? We have all of these design elements, these three, finance, regulation, and support services. In our own work for the last 15 years, we have used four major criteria and we have not been told that these are bad criteria or the wrong criteria 
or were missing. So they seem to be pretty complete based on the uh, ability for the academic world to attack them, and it has not. It's accepted them. The first is freedom to choose, and I'll describe each. The second is what we call productive efficiency. The third is equity, and the fourth, social cohesion. These are four criteria for which we can evaluate any educational system, whether it's vouchers or other forms of privatization or a government uh, system. Freedom of choice is a right that we generally give to parents to give to their children their values, their religious beliefs, their political perspectives, and freedom of choice in schooling then would be to allow them to choose a school that reflects these kinds of preferences and child-rearing practices. Productive efficiency refers to maximizing the effectiveness of the, the resources we use for education. Very important. I mean, we know, of course, right here that uh, there have been very large cuts in budgets allocated to schools. And so we are really concerned that we maximize the effectiveness of the resources that remain and hope that if we can get additional resources, we can do the same. Uh, I want to remind you that this is not just test scores, even though in the modern world, it seems that all of these comparisons, you know, PISA 2012 will be coming out at the end of this year. And La Vanguardia, El País, all of the newspapers will be quoting the results, whatever they are, for the next three or four months, okay? S and what will the results be based on? Just the test scores and three subjects that PISA measures for 15-year-olds. That's where they're doing the measurement. It's all 15-year-olds. It's the only, that's the only age group that is uh, involved in PISA. But there are also other issues, interpersonal skills, intrapersonal skills, values and attitudes. So in looking at an evaluation of an educational system and its productive efficiency, we want to look at more than just the test scores. Equity is so obvious a concern in our societies. The idea of providing fairness and access to educational opportunities, resources, outcomes by gender, social class, race, language origins, disabilities, and geographical location of students. And I don't think more needs to be said about that dimension because it's one that's pretty widely accepted, at least in principle. Often not accepted in terms of what I want for my child that has little to do with the equity for someone else, but that's another issue. Okay, this is the, le the last one, which is going to be a very deep concern here, is social cohesion. Preparing the young for democratic and civic participation by providing a common educational experience with respect to curriculum, values, language, and institutional orientations so that students from many different backgrounds will accept and support a common set of social, political, and economic arrangements that are foundational to a stable and democratic society. Uh, I might remind you that something is happening in Turkey right now where there are real issues about this. So this is not something that is just in kind of academic uh, uh, nube, you know. This, this is real. It was real in Yugoslavia. It never happened in Yugoslavia because the different provinces had their own educational systems separated along many different lines. And so the children were not educated in a way that made Yugoslavia one society. So we have to take this very seriously. Well, let me just mention that voucher plans, I'm gonna do this quickly because of the time element, uh, they vary tremendously. The Friedman plan had a flat voucher. It was very modest. Parents could add to it. There were virtually no regulations other than a minimal curriculum. Uh, admissions would be determined by school and there would be no government provided information or transportation. Uh, Chile. Chile has private schools also that can choose their students, but public schools must accept 
any student who applies. They have used a flat voucher at each educational level, but with recently some adjustment for at-risk students. There's national curriculum and testing, very different than the Friedman plan. And private schools can add fees that are limited, but they have grown over time. The Netherlands provides a flat subvention per student, no fees allowed. Private schools can choose students. Public schools must accept all applicants. There is, again, extra funding for immigrants and children from families with low parental education, but the private schools cannot earn profits. They can only be non-profit schools, and this is strictly regulated. Now, there are trade-offs and conflicts. You could say, let's do all of those, all four of those goals, you know, freedom of choice and social cohesion. You can't. It turns out that, for example, if you provide support services such as transportation, these have high cost and they reduce funds for instruction, meaning the productive efficiency um, of education. A common curriculum and testing improves social cohesion, but they reduce choice because schools now are more alike. Huh? Philanthropy, parent fees increase funding for some students and choice, but they reduce equity. So the goal then has to be, how do we achieve balance? What kind of system do we want to create or reform that will achieve balance among these criteria? Now, what does research in the last decade tell us? Well, the first is, if we look at the evidence from many different countries, many different plans, they all increase freedom of choice relative to a government operated system. Interestingly enough, this claim that competition will get schools to improve academic achievement has not been found to be the case. Sometimes there are weak results in favor, sometimes weak results showing no advantage. What we do know is parent satisfaction is higher and that's part of freedom of choice. Parents like the idea that they can choose the school to send their child to. There's evidence of increased segregation and stratification in all of these situations, in Chile, in the Netherlands, in New Zealand, in Sweden. Uh, immigrants, for example, in all of these countries, in the large cities, are more segregated than we find in the US cities. And they're segregated in US cities as well. And I think if you were to look at Catalonia, España, you would find a lot of segregation, particularly of immigrants in schools. And there's little evidence right now on social cohesion. It's very difficult to collect evidence on social cohesion because the true effects of education on social cohesion take place largely in adulthood, which is so far removed from the actual time of the schooling, it's very difficult to capture in research. Um, as I've mentioned, I'm going to go through these quickly. Freedom of choice always increases under these kinds of plans, as you would expect. Uh, and the extent of that depends on the regulations. Um, productive efficiency, all of the evidence is limited to test scores. We have no evidence on what are called the non-cognitive outcomes, including many cognitive outcomes such as problem solving. We're all concerned in our society about producing more entrepreneurs, more ideas, more crea creativity. The tests do not measure those elements. There are some tests that try to, but they're not the ones that are used. They're ones that are primarily uh, adapted for research. The studies tend to be fairly weak in adjusting for student selection. That is, it's not just schools that are differ different, but they attract different groups of students. And the question is, if you were to find a difference in educational results, are they due to a difference in students, or are they different due to differences in what schools are able to do? And most studies don't separate those out very well. They try, but they're very difficult to, to separate out. Uh, so there are mixed results and small differences. On equity, we have stronger findings. 
there's increased stratification by income and ethnicity in some very, very good studies for Chile, Netherlands, and Sweden. Um, where you have school fees that can change, that there can be higher school, schools requesting them, we see students mainly from higher income families. That's not a surprise by any means. And the higher socioeconomic schools, this is an interesting finding, also attract teachers and principals with greater qualifications. So it's not just the class sizes are smaller or there are other benefits, there's a larger curriculum, but there's a kind of natural flow of personnel resources to schools that have higher socioeconomic students and that charge higher fees. And that's pretty well established. I don't know of any exceptions to that. In terms of social cohesion, we have little direct evidence, as I've mentioned, but stratification by populations leads to different educational experiences. Uh, we know that students have limited or no contact with students from other income backgrounds or eth ethnic uh, backgrounds, and that that becomes more extreme with systems of privatization. Now, in Catalonia, there are some interesting questions that have to be raised. How do you view social cohesion? I mean, if you're a nationalist, then you say, well, social cohesion is Catalonia, Catalan, not just the language, but it's our nation, it's, it's our culture. You want to think about that a little bit in a system of privatization because uh, recent immigrants are not Catalanes, and they don't have the same historical background, religious background, cultural backgrounds. Uh, and we can tell just from the way they behave in terms of neighborhoods that they choose and other kinds of attachments that the kind of schools that they would have under a choice or privatization approach would be quite different than what we might think about when we think of Catalan schools. So the issue of social cohesion, you want to look at very carefully. Is there a common core that even people in País Vasco or Galicia, or as we call broadly here, Madrid, would embrace? Well, I think most of us would embrace cer certain kinds of values. Uh, most of us are not excited about the stories of corruption, chorizos, right? Uh, so th there's a value there, I think, that we all embrace, <laughs> which is anti-corruption, honesty, a certain ethic that we all share. And so, again, this is not an easy question to answer here or anywhere, actually. What principles are shared? Civic engagement, economic participation in local and world economies, honest and efficient government? It turns out that there are a lot of them, even though there may be a tendency to see each part of this country and each part of the world as absolutely unique, which has its own virtues for social cohesion. Where should the emphasis be placed? Well, I'm not going to say another word about this. You can see the escala de justicia, the equilibrio, whatever that is for a society. But that has to be considered because there's no system that can maximize each of these dimensions without interfering with the others. Context is important, so you want to consider that. Europe has very low indi indigenous birth rates in s many countries, including this one, I believe. You are not even at the level of replacement or barely at the level of repla natural replacement for the indigenous population. And so, unless you want to have very few young people supporting huge numbers of older people, which it turns out is arith arithmetically impossible, we have to have inflows of immigrants. And having inflows of immigrants automatically makes social cohesion and equity a challenge. I'm gonna just mention Sweden. I'm almost at the end for those of you who are impatient to uh, get started questioning. In Sweden, as I mentioned, their educational voucher system started in 1992. 
you can get a flat allocation whether you send your child to a public or an independent school, as they are called independent schools. Uh, many of the independent schools are for profit. Uh, in the States, most of them are not. 95% are religiously oriented or oriented towards some kind of uh, social mission, not for profit. But in uh, Stockholm, and I should say in Sweden, uh, many of them make very large profits. Um, they've gone f in 20 years from perhaps 1% in independent schools unsubsidized now to about 20% of students in independent schools, which is a very big change, and about half in Stockholm and in some of the other large cities, Göteborg, Lund. This is something interesting. Since 1992, if we look at PISA, if we look at TIMS, the International Mathematics and Science scores, uh, they have declined very precipitously in Sweden over this period of time. Exactly the opposite prediction that people who argue that a competitive market would, uh, w would improve. And interestingly, all studies of equity show an increase in stratification by immigrant and social class and increasing inequality in test results. We don't look just at the level, the average, the test results, but we look at the variance, the range. And so-called among school variance has increased over time. Policy choices, well, I, I've talked about equilibrium, balancing, competing goals, family preferences. Merci. Thank you. you. You know as an economist that usually we say, well, on the one hand, well, on the other hand, but I can put my hands like this in answering it. The context is very, very important. But consider this. Um, two, con two countries that are having very serious problems in terms of uh, increase, let's say, in inequality, educational inequality, are Sweden and Holland. And if we were to look at Sweden and Holland, they're relatively egalitarian countries in most other dimensions. And so, in a sense, we always like to think that maybe schools will make people um, uh, it makes society more equal. But here are two relatively equal societies where the schools seem to be going in the opposite direction. So th I, th this, is, this is one example. But I, I think that the context is very important. And this is why I cannot give an answer to the initial question that I started with on privatization. Because the answer has to come from you. The answer has to come from this society. The answer has to come in a dynamic situation. It not only crisis and not only economic, but changes happening around the world, the flows of immigrants. Um, how, how can we solve this problem of social cohesion when differences seem so large initially? And in a sense, we in the US were very lucky because we are a nation of immigrants. It's not uh, it's not something that we said, gee, we, are, we now have immigrants. We, do, we are concerned, of course. Every generation is concerned about this issue. But in our context, I'm an immigrant. My family came to the US 200 years ago, but it re I'm still from an immigrant family. I, I was not part of the states, the, uh, the real indigenous population 2,000 years ago in the states. We, we are all immigrants. And so, you, you have to take account of all of these in terms of addressing this particular conundrum that I have in back of me. Often when Carnoy comes, he comes as an advocate. And I come to you as an academic in the following sense. I like to present what the issues are. And you have to make decisions in terms of this kind of balance. How you define each of these four, you may, you may have other dimensions that we have not used or, or found, but laying out 
the overall picture and letting you make the decision. Now, does, what does that mean? Okay, well, let me be a Carnoy. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not enthusiastic about educational vouchers at all. And if you were to look at some of my writings, starting in, well, a long time ago, I was going to give you a year, but then you'd find out that I'm probably older than 52. I might be 53 or 54, and I don't like that, okay? So, um, I have written against vouchers. I have even debated Milton Friedman on that topic. It, it's, that's, I think, available on, on the internet uh, when the um, Eastern Bloc fell Friedman was given a uh, public television show to show that he had predicted the fall and then had a series, and one of them was on education, which he advertised, uh, of course, his voucher plan. And then there was a debate after half hour. There was a half hour debate, and he and I uh, argued over it. So let me just tell you so that you know where my, where my commitment is. As I look at the overall picture, in countries like ours, I'm not enthusiastic about vouchers at all. I should also tell you that the National, the, no, I'm sorry, the uh, Royal Academy of Sciences of Sweden had a two-day seminar uh, in March because they were concerned about what the evidence shows after 20 years. And I was asked to be the keynote speaker there. And they were so alarmed by the evidence that that debate is still going on now. If any of you, you know, can speak Swedish, you know, and you go to uh, the Swedish newspapers, you're going to, in fact, you can find it on, on, on the web also. But let me tell you, just to give you the other side, again, being an academic, can I think of a place, a context, where vouchers should be considered? And the answer is yes. Um, where? In rural er areas and urban areas of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, I can give you a whole number of places in South Asia where the following exists. You do not have enough places in the public schools for the poor in those places. And I'm talking about basic education. I'm not talking about high schools or anything of this sort. Secondly, the teachers belong to the ruling political party, and they don't have to show up. The typical absentee rate in these areas is about 40%. That is, almost half of the teachers do not show up on a given day. What happens to them? Nothing. As long as they can get out the vote for the party, they are protected from any dismissal or any discipline whatsoever. So you neither have spaces for these children but even the children in these schools suffer. Why? Because the teachers teach nonsense. What do I mean by that? Well, the teachers have relatively low salaries and they get a substantial portion of their income by tutoring the students after school and on the weekends. And so they have an incentive. Every parent knows that the child will not pass the examination without paying tutoring expenses, which amount, particularly for a family with more than one child, to more than any voucher would cost in India. So I look at this equity, and I ask myself, that's very important to me, uh, which is a better system? This system, this corrupt system of government schools which is not changing, um, which is designed to take advantage of children. But, and by the, by the way, children are told not to bother to come to school if they cannot pay the teacher for these tutoring. The tutoring, by the way, many of us think of tutoring one-to-one. -one. No, these are 30 students where each parent is paying 12% of the income per child for the tutoring sessions. Um, in the spirit of justice, I think that a voucher system in which parents could choose and could get out of that kind of school if they weren't able to, uh, the child were not succeeding or the school had teacher absenteeism, teachers teaching nonsense, 
I think that a voucher system would be a better solution. How do I know that? Because we've started such a system in uh, Pakistan. We now have, I believe, around 40,000 students who otherwise would, I, would not be in school at all or would be in schools where they would not be getting the education in the regular school sessions where they could pass the examinations. So I, I want to tell you that, that, that there is a point where you have to stand back and you have to be serious about looking at these and looking at where your values are and making a decision. And there are some exceptions. They're, they're not in the US and they're probably not in Western Europe, uh, probably not in the, in, in, um, the East, Eastern countries in Europe either that I would favor vouchers. So I want to be very upfront about that. Now, in terms of um, choice, look, we have to get used to the idea that all solutions will be imperfect. As long as you have conflicts, trade-offs among these goals and your ways of reaching these goals, trying to reach more of one harms another, there's going to be conflict and tension. There's tension between the public goals of education and the private goals of education. And we just have to get used to living with them, not coming out with a perfect solution, but coming out with the very best solution we can, given what we know. There are many common features of a voucher type plan and the system we have here in Catalonia. But there are, there are also differences. There are regulations here. There are various kinds of criteria in which you have uh, an attempt for schools to teach things that would move towards social cohesion. And so I, so I think it's, it's really a combination of things. And, and it's, it's far from a pure voucher system. But it's also quite different than just a system of uh, government schools based on equity. And any s one of the things that, that I find interesting, by the way, about school choice is this, that study after study that has been carried out to find out what information parents have about schools and how they choose schools shows something quite interesting. It shows that they mainly choose schools on the basis of what kind of families send their children to those schools. Now, they, they might be very terrible schools in terms of the quality of the education, but the notion being that if, you know, uh, you, you, you name, uh, I, I won't get into trouble by naming someone, well, if, uh, if um, Penelope sends her children to this school, it must be a good school. And parents actually walk around. Oh, where does your child go to school? Oh, you know, St. Agnes. That's the school that uh, Penelope sends her children to. Uh, that's common around the world. That is, a good school is one where good families send their children. Now, so-called non-good families usually don't have very much choice. Uh, they don't have the funds to pay for the extra things that are required, whether the school requires them directly or whether they're required because kids who go to that school need extra materials, n have to have other kinds of experiences outside of the school in order to fit into the school and so on. So this is one of the very, very big, in, in my opinion, myths about school choice that people choose the best school for their child. They choose the school that they want their child to go to based largely on who else goes to that school. And in some cases, it's, it's, a, it's purely symbolic. Their child may not be friends with the children of those important people, but they walk around in the States I think you all know who Carolyn Kennedy is. Carolyn Kennedy, when she had her first child reaching school age, 
the media paid great attention to what decision she was going to make. Would she send her child to what were supposed to be very good schools in her community? Um, would she send them to the local Catholic school, which is also very good, uh, considered to be very good, and so on? It turns out she made the decision to send the child to the local Catholic school. In the following year, the applications for that school increased by 400%. The school didn't change, so what happened? So these are some things you, you know, that I don't have time to go into in terms of, of what we know, but they're very, very important in any particular context as you think about what will be the effect on the system. Now, as, as far as the questions left, I, I was thinking, I hadn't drawn these to be left or right, but it is true that choice and productive efficiency are much more argued on, by people on the right, and equity and social cohesion much more by people on the left. It's actually true. However, I would argue that there are trade-offs among all four of these, that it isn't really the pairs that you see here. I just didn't have a nice way of trying to show the same thing on the Roman balance. Uh, but, but wanted to emphasize that as we look at these policy designs, you think you can improve one thing, but then if you look carefully, you'll find that you've changed and compromised something else. And now you have to make a value decision that is which is more important. And we're, that's the business we're in. Anyone who works with edu education in terms of making good policy decisions should always realize that we're constantly weighing values in one direction versus values in the other, and policies that hopefully create a balance. The right to education is, is a very tricky term because the term education is very ambiguous. It's very vague. And so one might wish to say, what are the details? When we say right to education, does that mean just a right to attend a school does that mean that there will be obligatory education, mandatory education for a certain number of years? Does that mean when we say the same for everyone, it seems to me that the last question and the first question are very much like this. Uh, does it mean the same education for a child with disabilities as a, ch a child who, who doesn't have disabilities? I think most of us would reasonably agree, well, no, it doesn't really mean those things. So you have, to, you have to really go to the question of what do you mean by an equal education for everyone? And when you get to that point where you're debating and discussing it, you'll find that we don't necessarily agree. We may agree on just some principles. Children with disabilities deserve some differences in their education than children without disabilities. We would agree with that try to get to precisely what those differences should be, how much you're willing to invest in those things. And that's what I mentioned, when we always have these tensions within education. There is no simple solution, and we're not gonna solve it with words. We can all agree on every child has a right, even to a good education, or to a wonderful education, and we haven't begun to address the details of what that means and how to provide it. So getting into the components, you don't necessarily have to use these. You can use ones that you feel are pertinent, but you actually do have to get into those details. Okay, now in terms of uh, the question of pre-primary education, post-secondary education, in general, this distinction between the public and the private goals makes the assumption that in the early years of formacion, you have to be worried about social cohesion. You have to be worried about equity. But if we deliver young people at, let's say, the age of 18, university age, and we've done what we can, then it's choices that they have to make, it's decisions 
that are based on what they bring to the university. N none of us would begin to say that everyone who goes to the university must come out equal in terms of uh, opportunities to work in a particular occupation because we recognize that there are differences among individuals in terms of the effort that they put in, their ganas, their abilities, and but the question is can we make the formacion fair so that everyone has those opportunities? Now that's not an easy question to answer. A family, for example, that comes from another linguistic background uh, is not in the same position to provide opportunities. But if we go early enough and we start off zero to three and we're concerned about nutrition, we're concerned about the prenatal care, we're concerned about uh, giving parenting, parents skills in order to begin to use a lot of language with their children, uh, discussions, uh, getting the parents themselves involved in learning the mainstream language being part of that, which of course is very important here in Catalonia, the idea is that at some age, whatever it is, and indeed, it's in our laws, because we set mandatory, or what is it, educación obligatorio, right? And implicitly, what we're saying is at the end of that, there should be opportunities for individuals to go in their own paths and to make their own decisions on whether they want to continue, what kind of education, and so on, life, lifelong learning. But we want the opportunities to be there, even if it's no longer obligatorio, right? Uh, th this, this last issue on the, the, the debate here, in my opinion, the first thing is that I would not use Yugoslavia as an example for Spain. Uh, Yugoslavia is a very, was, I should always say was, see I'm so old that I still say is, but it was a very modern country. It came out of the fall of the Ottoman Empire, you know, at least for me we're, we're talking about less than a century ago and then it was pulled together and then really pulled together with a lot of power at, after World War II by uh, the, the Soviet Union, but the history was not the same as the history of Spain. There are parallels, obviously. Uh, the Catalanes have a very, very long history. The Basques, we don't even know when they got there. And they don't speak anything like Hungarian or Finnish. That's a myth. Uh, the Gallegos, we know something more about, but I mean, these are all ancient civilizations compared to Yugoslavia. And there wasn't a long period of time for them to, in a sense, meld together as a nation. They were forced to be a nation. Well, the Christian kings did the same thing with Spain, but it was a much longer period of time, and there was a longer history leading up to those events, okay? So I don't mean to imply at all that, oh, as we look at the, the regionalism and the autonomy and the differences in languages, we're talking about Yugoslavia. Uh, there were also much larger differences in religion, where one area was Roman Catholic, another was Eastern or Orthodox Catholic, and another was Islamic from the, from the Muslim invasions in the, in the Middle Ages. That created a very different setting, okay? Now, talking concretely about Spain today, some of you will not like this, but by living together for so long, even perhaps in opposition, there's much more commonality across Spain than we might give credit to. It, with the nationalist movement, the tendency is to emphasize differences, and there are differences. In no way would I suggest that, 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 that there are not. But there are also some similarities. I mentioned some. Does everyone like, uh, like uh, the chorizos de los bancos? I don't think so. That's a very ugly example, very ugly, and we fail, right? But, but the point is that we have some values that we all share. And if we were to list these, they would be 
there would be a long list. And not only within Spain, but across Europe. And even with my country, the US, you know, the Wild West, we share a lot of things that we would want to get in to social cohesion. We would want our children to embrace. We think they're very important for a democratic nation. So again, I like your point from before, which is context is important, and we want to look at context. How we can resolve the issue of social cohesion, in the US, we've done it in a certain way. I'm not a big uh, aficionado de Texas, okay? Some of you may be, I'm not, okay? Um, but I share certain things, and my education, which was in New Jersey, shares certain things with children in Texas, and then other things it doesn't. We were never taught, for example, that guns are good, that there ought to be a gun culture. But in the state of Texas, this is embedded in the schools and the culture and everything. So the idea is, what are the things that we want for social cohesion and that are important regionally? And what are the things that we share? And I think the mention was mentioned of a world perspective. So not just with the rest of this country and not just with Europe, but in terms of a world that is democratic and productive and good for human development and good for human beings, which goes a lot, sustainable sus environment. Something else, I don't, think, I don't think that we would fight with Texas if Texas treats its children to each grade dealing with how we, we address ecology. And I don't think that that's the major issue between Catalonia and Madrid. So what we want to do is to look at this, look at this question and ask, what is it that we share? What makes us unique? In the US, as it turns out, all of our educational systems you know, are independent of the national government. We have 50 state educational systems, and the Constitution on education doesn't exist at the federal level. It only exists at the state level. That is, our constitutional rights to an education exist only in the state constitutions. And so you could say, well, every state with a different educational system, but it turns out that ex post facto, <laughs> when you look, there are a lot of similarities in terms of these kind of issues, social cohesion issues, and there are some differences too. Guns being one of them that I would be concerned with, okay? So these are some things that we might want to think about. Thank you very much, merci, gracias.